Hello everyone and welcome back to the Spanish Sling, a podcast where we try to bridge the gap between the Spanish and Singaporean companies and encourage economic relations between them. Today we wanted to explore the fascinating world of quantum technologies, its implication and the opportunities for Spanish businesses in Singapore. This is why we welcome today to the Spanish Sling Jose Ignacio La Torre, PhD in particle physics, uh, also director of, of for the Center of Quantum Technologies in Singapore, professor at the National University of Singapore, and chief research officer at the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Such a strong and great curriculum. So thank yeah. you very much for agreeing to have this interview. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And uh, Jose Ignacio, in this first part of the interview, we're going to focus on the quantum technologies in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So for those who are not really familiar with the terms, the sector itself, uh, because it's such an interesting and also difficult uh, thing to, to explore if you're not familiar with it. What exactly is the purpose of quantum technologies and what different areas and implications do they have? Uh, an easy question. <laughs> yes, an easy I, question. I know it's difficult. Uh, yeah, to, to understand uh, in, a, in a better way uh, what quantum technologies are, uh, one should understand that we humans are living the time where we have amazing control of individual elements of nature. So we can control a single electron, a single photon, we can manipulate atoms at will. So this opened the possibility of encoding information in a quantum matter and manipulate it and even communicate with it. So quantum technologies is just the result of our understanding of nature uh, with the purpose of using it for our industry. In particular, there are three main applications. One is in the, uh, for communications. We can now have a quantum communication. We can communicate with absolute uh, security due to the loss of quantum mechanics. A second big branch, uh, line of applications is what we call quantum sensing. We have amazing uh, elements of nature that become the best possible sensors ever. We can use one molecule to analyze the structure, the chemical structure of a protein. And the third and the most famous one is quantum computing. So we are able to now process information, uh, which means computing, in a way that we, we never thought of. So, and the consequences of this enormous control we have now on matter are really a little bit unpredictable. We don't really know how far we can get. Yeah, it's amazing the extent of science and how humans will have been able to achieve this. Uh, what is the, how is the sector in, in Singapore, because you have been working here in Singapore, but also in Europe, so what are the main differences that you perceive in, in the sector in both? There is a, something common, which is that there is a quantum race. Everybody is uh, racing here to get <laughs> control of quantum technologies. Yeah. Uh, there are, the main differences are essentially the US, China, uh, Europe, and then a small country like Singapore. Uh, what is the, how it can handle this race, or how it can position itself in the race. So in, let me very briefly say that the USA is dominated by corporations uh, like uh, Google, like mm -hmm. IBM, like Microsoft, uh, like startups there. In China, it's dominated by the public sector, by the government. In Europe, we have a mixture where the European Union is playing a fundamental role. We have a quantum flagship. So what is the situation in Singapore? Well, uh, Singapore is a small but a coherent country. So it is really all the stakeholders in Singapore that understand that quantum technologies are here to stay and to change the economy. So what we're witnessing is a, a collaboration across uh, different departments to guarantee that we attract and retain talent, we educate talent, that we develop basic research, that we develop applied research, and that we go towards industry, we have innovation. So the big difference between Singapore and other countries is the coordination. Here it's really highly coordinated, and therefore it may be very, very successful, let me say. So I have heard about the word collaboration, but maybe in different departments, but also 
uh, your experience or your know-how on the different countries. So is there really a global collaboration in quantum technologies? And global on the planet? Yeah, global no on the way. planet. <laughs> so, <laughs> no way. So th there's no way there's a global collaboration. No, it's a, it's a race, it's a, it's a battle, it's a war. So, so being, being a race, what are the main players? What are those who are really making a change? The, the, main, the dominant player by far is the USA at this moment. Mm -hmm. But um, precisely, it's a little bit sad as a scientist that, uh, you know, I'm a romantic. So I should have lived in the Renaissance myself. So what we, are, <laughs> what we are witnessing is the opposite. So science is becoming proprietary. People now don't want to share the results of, the, of their research. You're, you know that, for instance, the, there is a, an enormous push to keep data proprietary, mm -hmm. not to share data with other people, let alone uh, the edge of knowledge. So in particular, if a quantum computer, a real powerful quantum computer is constructed by any country, it will never be shared. Yeah. Okay, so this is clear. By the way, this is one of the reasons why there are uh, quantum plants essentially in every country, okay. uh, including Spain, <laughs> including Singapore, including uh, every country. So we have to be clear that the future of science will be less open source than many of us would like. Yeah, that's a pity. In a way. It's yes. a pity. Yeah. Yes, and nowadays I understand that when quantum technologies have reached a research stage. Mm -hmm. But is it the idea to reach a commercial stage? Is that the sure. purpose? Absolutely. No, uh, uh, I would say that uh, in the 90s and uh, first decade of the 21st century, uh, the, the so quantum technologies were at the level of the laboratories. Mm -hmm. mm, but in the last decade, we have moved away from the laboratory. Mm -hmm. So you do have now startups, companies that make quantum communication uh, available mm -hmm. on commercial terms. Uh, we at the Center for Quantum Technologies, we have uh, six startups that are commercial. Mm -hmm. and that work and two in stealth mode, so total of eight, uh, and they have received quite a, an amount of funding, including external funding to Singapore, so funding which goes beyond Singapore. Now, definitely, uh, quantum technologies are already in the market, so it's one of the uh, focuses of many uh, venture capital. Uh, mm -hmm different countries, uh, they, they want to have part of their investments in uh, quantum technologies. Mm -hmm. So you may have different focuses, now you may have bio, you may have um, uh, blockchain, you may have uh, definitely quantum is one of them. Yes, so once they have reached the market, we have now the commercial state. I want to introduce this debate, do quantum technologies need ethics? A lot. <laughs> I guess so. I'm, uh, I wrote a book. <laughs> I knew that. So I wrote a book, the, so definitely. I wanted to ask you a question yeah, because I think it's really interesting. Yeah, the, the idea is that uh, knowledge is power, and power can be used for the good and for the bad. Mm -hmm. So, uh, getting to uh, achieving a level of, of uh, scientific. Uh, development or, and technological development mm -hmm. without ethics, it's really dangerous, okay? Mm -hmm. Because automatically there will be a misuse of, uh, of whatever we learn. I keep saying that when humans invented the fire, they burn the village of the other guy. When we discover, you know, the atom, we made the atomic bomb. When we understood biology, we made uh, biological weapons. So the probability that uh, edge knowledge becomes is used in a, is misuse against other humans is very high. Yeah. Uh, then in the other, you know, democracies, parliaments mm -hmm. uh, take over, and the use of technology becomes more reasonable. Okay. 
Okay, so actually now it's much more than in the early 19th century. Now in the early 19th century, the average um, lifetime for a person was 36 years, and now we are over 80. So definitely, technology is helping us. Mm -hmm. Okay, this said, uh, I think we governments should be really on top of what's going on in quantum and in artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to guarantee that uh, there is no misuse of those technologies. Yeah, precisely, because with progress comes a responsibility as an ethic responsibility. And finally, Jose Ignacio, I want to conclude this first part of the interview with your opinion on the vision of the sector in the following years. So how do you envision the sector? Oh, the sector is uh, moving, it's being defined on the spot, okay? It's moving very fast. So it will be, uh, it's a sector that the, uh, the winners are those that move fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not for conservative people. It's really for uh, aggressive investors. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the way I see it. Uh, it is a mid-term uh, sector. It's not a whatever profit will not happen in the next five years. It will not take uh, fifty years. No? It's really we are talking here for. Uh, big uh, return uh, in, in 10 years. This is how I see it. May I say that it's changing so fast. Every day something happens. Every day. It's really spectacular. Wow. Well, thank you very much for, for explaining us this exciting sector. We will see it in the following years how it evolves. And yeah. certainly we will see your contributions in it. <laughs> certainly. So thank you very much for taking Thank you. Thank you.